Good afternoon and welcome to the latest edition of Grantwood in Focus, which is our series of quarterly Zoom presentations dealing with the life and art of Grant Wood. My name is Sean Ulmer. I'm executive director here at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. And I want to thank you for allowing me to record this presentation um, since I will be traveling when we are planning to air it. Um, and so unfortunately, we would not be able to take questions and answers at the end of this presentation. Um, but I hope that you are able to enjoy it both when it airs and then later um, when we add it to YouTube. So um, today we're going to look at a work by Grant Wood that's been in the collection um, for a long time now. Um, and it's a part of a series of works that Grant Wood did when he went to Paris in 1920 with his good friend Marvin Cohn. Uh, and uh, I was recently uh, fortunate enough to be in Paris, um, which is my favorite city in the world. And uh, when I go to Paris, uh, if I have time, I carve out a little bit of time to kind of uh, explore areas of the city that I've not seen on previous trips and to look specifically um, for um, locations where I know Grant Wood created artwork uh, to see exactly where he was standing at the time that he created the work. So um, let me share my screen here and bring up my um, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Just a second. And then let's uh, start as a full screen there. So uh, wonderful. Hopefully you can see um, the my screen. Um, I'm calling this uh, presentation of Grant Wood in Focus, Hunting Grant Wood. Um, because, as I said, on previous trips to Paris, I have taken some time to try and figure out where Grant Wood was standing when he painted some of his uh, some of his works um, when traveling to to France. I'll talk a little bit more about his trips to France in a moment. But um, the work that we're going to look at today, specifically a single work, is called "From the Roman Amphitheater," and it dates from 1920. Um, so I wanted to share that with you here, so that you can see this uh, while uh, you're looking at it. Uh, Grant Wood. Um, uh, made his first trip abroad in 1920, in the summer of 1920, with his good friend Marvin Coe. Uh, Marvin had been to France before in World War I, where he served as a French translator um, for, uh, for, for a couple of generals um, in World War I. Um, Grant Wood also served in World War I, but he did not um, get dis, uh, dispatched abroad. He was stationed in Washington, D.C., where he was painting camouflage. Uh, on uh, or designing camouflage for for war um, um, vehicles, uh, and so um, Marvin Cohn returns um, in 1919 at the at the close of the war. Um, took a while to send all the GIs back, and he vows to return to um, to France, uh, specifically to Paris, at the first opportunity that he gets. And he actually takes that opportunity the very next summer, the summer of 1920, when Marvin comes back. He teaches. Uh, is teaching French at Co College here in town. Um, and um, and so he is able in the summertime to get away um, and return to France, specifically to Paris. And he takes his best friend, Grant Wood, with him, which was uh, fortuitous for Grant because Marvin Cohn knew the language very well, having served as a translator um, and could help them get around. Um, and so they leave for France in June, early June, of 1920 by way of Chicago and then Montreal, where they caught uh, the boat and sailed, landed in Liverpool, trained over to London, then down um, uh, after crossing um, to Paris and arrive in Paris in later June. And they are there um, uh, into early September. So they uh, really spend uh, late August, early September. Uh, we know some of their travels um, and the things that they did um, uh, on this trip from Marvin Cohn's diary, which he kept um, uh, for the 1920 trip. Unfortunately, the last pages of that diary are gone. Um, uh, they did not survive. Um, and so the last entry that we have is from August 22nd. Um, but they're still in Paris at that time and they're getting ready to leave. So late August, early September is when they return. It gives them a good uh, nearly three months uh, in the summer. And it's a, the diary is a wonderful um, uh, resource uh, for knowing what these two young Cedar Rapidian artists did on a, on each day during uh, during their trip. In fact, this particular painting 
I think we can more specifically date to July 29th, 1920. Um, because in Marvin Cohn's diary, he, uh, he enters the following information. To the Louvre in morning, eight at Place Saint-Michel, Grant bought a cap. I painted in Luxembourg Gardens, Grant near Roman Arena. In the in evening, we painted down on river front of Notre Dame. Um, so that was the entire entry for um, for July 29th. Um, but it but Marvin is recording that Grant Wood is painting by the Roman Arena. Um, and the Roman Arena is what is uh, also known as the Roman Amphitheater. Um, so it was on that day that Grant Wood was painting, no doubt, this particular um, oil on composition board. Uh, so um, this has been uh, an interesting work to me. I have not tracked this one down on previous trips, although I've tracked down other locations on, on earlier trips. I'm going to uh, advance so you can get a much better look um, at this painting. You see, um, Grant Wood is still very much working in the American Impressionist style. Um, his brushwork is loose and painterly. Um, he's very interested in light and shadow, um, which is very typical. Um, and so at this point, he is an American Impressionist, as is Marvin Cohn. Um, and what better place for two young Impressionists to go than to the birthplace of Impressionism, France, and specifically um, uh, to Paris. A wonderful scene here uh, of a mother and child, and you see a little carriage there, um, some French architecture uh, in, in the background. Um, and so I was anxious to, um, to take a look at uh, the Roman uh, uh, arena. Um, in France um, and see, uh, try to see if I could figure out if enough remains that I could figure out where Grant Wood, Grant Wood was standing. So this is the, the Roman arena. Now, many people do not go to it. It's not, a, not the most popular site in Paris, um, but it is called the Arène de Lutèche, um, the arena of Lutetia. Um, and Lutetia was the Roman name for Paris. Um, and so it is basically the, uh, the arena of Paris, um, we would call it today. You can see it's a large uh, oval form um, with um, uh, a series of, of now kind of reconstructed stepped seating um, that you see here. Um, this was all uh, 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 covered over at one point in time as the city grew um, and was only rediscovered in the 19th century when they were doing some uh, modifications to a nearby road. Um, and so um, uh, several people were interested in seeing it brought back. Um, and one, uh, one of whom was Victor Hugo, the writer Victor Hugo was a, was a great proponent um, for this particular archeological find um, and restoring it as much as possible um, to, to the way that it looked. I have a few other images of it. Um, and you can see here a little bit higher up um, to the right-hand side of the image uh, is where the stage was. This is an arena that was used for theatrical productions, but also for gladiator combat um, with animals. Um, you can see some of the seating um, to the left-hand side, and you're seating up, sit, standing above other seating um, right in front of you. But to the right, um, at that angle, is, the, is where the stage was with a series of nine niches, which was really good apparently for acoustics, um, but also a place potentially that held um, statuary. Uh, um, here, uh, a more current view of it. You can see that it is being used um, by uh, the children in Paris. Um, it makes for a great play area. Um, the, uh, the seating uh, would have been sort of really around most of this oval form, um, but the seating that was in the center has been now been interrupted um, by, these, um, by these more modern Parisian buildings, these white buildings that you see here. Imagine the seating continuing all the way around um, the, the arena. It was not uh, seating completely in the round. It was really seating in sort of three quarters and then one quarter was left for the stage. So in some ways, it is actually much more like a Greek arena than a Roman arena because it wasn't completely um, uh, all, all the way around. Here, another view of people enjoying it, which sort of sitting on benches um, in the area. And here you see some of that seating. Now, this, again, is not original seating. This was all reconstructed um, after the discovery. But you can see that it is sort of built into the hillside. And this is the hill to, hill of St. Um, in in that section. It's in the fourth arrondissement. Um, so it is um, uh, on... 
uh, the, the the southern side to the Sen, um, and uh, and and just but you can imagine that there were two tiers of of seating that kind of kept going up, and that it was it would have been continuous um, with um, uh, the 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 seating that can be found on the right hand side. Um, at this point, you're kind of standing uh, on the stage area. Here's a reconstruction of what Roman Paris looked like, uh, Lutetia. Um, and um, you can see there in the center of the Seine is the Ile de la Cité. That's where Notre Dame would eventually be built. Um, and so um, the rest of the city really is on what they what they call the left bank, the, the, the Latin Quarter um, today. Um, you can see there were Roman temples. Um, there were a number of baths. Um, other than, and you can see the arena, right, um, sort of on the right-hand side, and lower right. Um, that um, is one of the more uh, um, complete uh, Roman artifacts, if you will, um, sites in Paris. The other are the baths that now make up the Museum of the Cluny, um, where the, where the Cluny um, uh, Abbey was built. Um, so those are the two major Roman sites still in Paris. Um, here, a, a kind of plan, you can see where the arena was, you can see where some of the other um, uh, major Roman sites were. They really did not occupy the island, although it was built up. There are some temples there, of course, and a palace, um, but most of the Roman settlement of, of Lutetia uh, is to be found um, uh, really on the south side of the Seine, um, and uh, that's where it was mostly built up, and you can see um, uh, the baths of uh, Cluny, which is now the Cluny Museum, what was the Cluny uh, Abbey at one point, um, right here in the arena we're talking about, um, is clearly marked. And this is a reconstruction of what that arena would have looked like. So you can see that that large oval form uh, remains intact today, but the rest of it is pretty much gone. This would have seated somewhere between 10 and 15,000 spectators it was a major arena. It was a major amphitheater. And you can see it was open on one end, um, which would have faced the stage, which is said was used for, for dramatic performances, for theatrical productions. Um, but it could also be used, from what we understand, um, for gladiator combat with animals. Um, here, uh, another reconstruction, uh, an imagined reconstruction of, of what it would have looked like with some of the awnings that would have protected the, the um, uh, the, the customers from, from the, the sun um, overhead. And you can see even with the stepping that happens out, it is really built sort of into the side of a, of a not so enormous hill, but, but a rise, a certain rise um, in, in the city of Paris. And here a model which shows it as well, perhaps a little bit clearer. Um, again, uh, many of the basic elements, the foundational elements, of the uh, of the amphitheater are still present. It's all of the 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 seating and the stage itself that are that is now missing um, today. And again, some of that has been taken away by more modern architecture um, in in uh, the city of uh, Paris. You can see it was quite immense. You saw the initial initial images of the arena um, and how big that was. Um, imagine the the amount of seating. That went around this was this was a major a major uh roman uh archaeological site um in paris so back to the painting so i kind of we've had this picture in in the um in the museum for some time now um and uh, i've often admired it i love grant wood's handling of light and sh shade here and the whole the tenderness of the mother and child and the little bassinet there uh the the uh Little stroller, uh, and um, and so I was like, I kind of pictured that her her back might be to the arena, or the arena might you know just it might be somewhere around. I really couldn't figure out whether the arena was still there or whole. I had never visited it, um, and so I thought, well, let, let me just sort of explore, see what see what I can find. Um, so there's three entrances today to the arena. And this is the entrance that we uh, took when we visited. So there is sort of this grand staircase that takes you to, to really one side. So we went up the staircase and you pop out onto the arena. So actually what you pop out onto is you pop out onto the stage from that, from that entrance point. Um, so that's what we did. We didn't realize where we would be coming out. We didn't realize that this enormous arena um, was present and really basically the heart of Paris. 
Um, and so you saw this large oval form. We saw these all these structures around. I'm trying to picture where Grant Wood might have been standing um, when he was when he was painting that picture. So kind of walked around the whole perimeter um, of the arena. You can you can drop down um, uh, the stairs. You can walk across the uh, the arena, kind of looking kind of looking around, looking mostly uh, a bit at the architecture. Um, to see if I could find like a profile of a building that would line up well um, with with the painting, um, and so really kind of explored the whole the whole area. I'm um, going up and down and all the entrances um, to really kind of get a sense of what angle Grant Wood might have been looking at um, as he was painting um, this particular uh, work of art, uh, and and nothing was really clicking for me. I just kept going back to this, and and I uh, and said, "Where is this architecture? What's going? What's what is happening here?" And and I said, "Well, you know, I know things have changed. I mean, from 1920 to the present day, it's been a hundred years. After all, things have changed. But but this doesn't feel at all like like the Roman amphitheater, like the arena." And I was like, "Oh, gee, what's what am I looking at here?" I said, "Well, there's there's." Some masonry, the woman's you know sitting up against the masonry. There's a there's a kind of a wrought iron fence behind her, um, and and across um, from her is is some more masonry that almost looks like a little bit of a of a balustrade, maybe a stone balustrade. And I said, wait a minute, I've seen a stone balustrade in the environs of the of the arena, the one I walked up to get to the arena. Um, and so um, I, I said, could this be the same stone balustrade that he was capturing in his painting? I mean, here is the a much more grand image of that of the balustrade. It's a lovely, tiny little pocket park adjacent to um, the arena at, at this point. I mean, you just basically walk, you know, a little bit beyond um, once you climb the steps, you walk a little bit further on and you're in the arena itself. Um, but I thought, oh, this, I wonder. So I positioned myself. I went back out the way I came and I looked out kind of, I said, oh my gosh, there's a wrought iron fence to the left with a piece of masonry. Um, and then across from that, there's more masonry and this stone balustrade. I said, could this have been where Grant Wood was standing? If you remove the flower box that's there now and you put a bench and you put a woman with a baby in a carriage um, uh, right next to it, yes, there he, it is. It is with the wrought iron the, the, and the masonry and the opening and then more masonry and the balustrade. This is where he was standing. Things have changed. There is no longer that patch of green to the right with a little bit of fencing around it. But I think we're in the right place. The major architectural features are lining up, but I need to keep looking. I need to be sure of this. Um, what go, what looks what's beyond that paraffin? What's beyond that balustrade? Does the architecture align with the architecture in the painting? Again, hundred years, things do change, but maybe there's enough still there that resembles what's in the painting to be sure that this is where Grand Wood was standing. So I started looking at this, this um, uh, lower uh, uh, piece of architecture with, with the dormers um, and, then, and then the rising architecture behind it. Um, and I kind of zoomed in with the camera a little bit. I had to reposition myself a tiny bit because trees have grown up, grown up and now you don't get a clear view uh, of, of the spaces Grant Wood had it. Um, but you see some resemblances between some of the architecture. And some of the roof lines have changed a, a slight bit, but um, by and large, things remain fairly intact. So um, when you look at this one building here with the dormers, the four dormers, you can see vestiges of those four dormers in this cream colored building with the shutters closed. Um, you can see that there's been some infill in the years since between the dormers to probably maximize the space um, in the attic there. Um, but the general form of the dormers is still there um, and more or less at the angle that I, that I was standing. 
how about the upper portion of the of the painting? So here we see um, uh, some similarities as well. We have uh, on the one hand uh, a building that rises above the dormers, um, but has had its upper portion removed um, in the intervening years. If one looks at um, sort of the angle and then coming straight across, it ends about the same amount again, uh, same amount above um, the large sort of uh, a whitewashed wall um, to the right, um, as can be found it today. Um, and so I said, okay, these two things, that lower building with those dormers, and then that that taller building behind, even though it's the roof line's been somewhat truncated and dormers have been inserted there too, um, these all align. The basic structure of the architecture behind has, um, has survived and helps to confirm that this painting uh, is, uh, is that I'm standing in the right location um, for this painting. And therefore it also helps to explain more clearly this figure here coming up next to the carriage, um, a gentleman wearing a hat, one presumes a gentleman uh, wearing a hat whom you only see the shoulders and head of. Um, and that's because this person is walking up those steps, those same steps that I walked up to, to get to, to the arena. So in essence, what we see here in this overall image um, is the site where Grant Wood was standing um, at the time that he um, uh, painted this picture, um, but he's standing there with his back to the arena. So even though it says from the Roman amphitheater, it is not an image of the Roman amphitheater. It is not an image of, of the Roman arena at all. Um, it is actually in the vicinity of um, and, and right adjacent to it, but looking sort of at this wonderful tender scene of this mother and child, of uh, people sort of and, and, uh, in the urban environment, uh, and, and really sort of some of the wonderful intersection of, of planes, of architectural planes, um, that one finds this kind of jumble of architecture that is frequently seen in, in Paris as it kind of grew um, uh, on its own. And I think Grant Wood was very fascinated with, um, with the angles, um, with the intersection of planes, um, with the play of light and shadow on those angles and planes um, in, in the city um, uh, that, he, that he was in. Um, and so it wasn't really about capturing the image of this great Roman archeological find, um, which had been preserved and restored um, through very concerted effort by some very important and influential people, it was really more this the city, the 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 everyday scenes adjacent um, to to that space, um, and that was fairly typical um, actually when when taken into the whole corpus of Grant Wood's work, it was fairly typical um, what he did when he traveled abroad. Um, as I mentioned, Grant Wood first made his, made his first trip to Paris in 1920 um, with Marvin Cohn. Here's a picture of Grant Wood by Marvin Cohn, and there's a similar one of Marvin Cohn by Grant Wood um, at the same uh, restaurant bar. Um, and here you see him looking very, very artistic uh, with a little goatee, um, uh, you know, uh, taking in the sights of Paris, um, uh, enjoying the theatrical productions, the musical productions, but according to, Grant, uh, to Marvin Cohn's diary, every day that, that the weather was, was agreeable, they went out and painted um, and spent all day painting. Um, and that was really the, the primary purpose of the trip. Um, here is an, is an example of another work that he made during, um, uh, during that trip in 1920. This is um, the Fountain of the Observatory in Paris. And this is a tiny little, uh, um, offshoot uh, garden of the Luxembourg Gardens, the very, very famous Luxembourg Gardens. Um, and so uh, Grant Wood, in this case, is focusing on Carpeau's Fountain that you see here. Um, and, and, and again, so just laying it down in a wonderfully impressionistic style. It's a very, very small work um, and, and really kind of capturing um, the mistiness of the day, the fogginess of the day. Um, um, which again is very, very typical uh, for impressionists who are very interested in, in the light effects that come from uh, different weather conditions and different seasons and different times of day and how that makes the same scene appear differently 
um, um, because of those because of those factors. Um, and so he's standing in uh, you know the Grand Luxembourg Gardens, but he's really capturing a tiny little snippet of it, just a really focused look at it. He's not he's not being a tourist. He's he's not going and checking things off his 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 tourist check card. Um, uh, he's not doing the bucket list sort of thing. He is really interested in those small and interesting little out of the way corners of gardens in the city that really capture what the city feels like. Um, in, uh, and you can see that in a work such as this or here. Um, he did this one called Place de la Concorde. Okay, and so we, this is one of the statues in the Place de la Concorde. And you can see the obelisk that graces the Place de la Concorde in the background. But he positions himself very, very carefully so that what he is not depicting is the Eiffel Tower. So to the left of this image, and these are all images I took on previous trips to Paris, um, you see the exact same statue. But Grant Wood has positioned himself to the left of that statue so that what's not in the scene is the Eiffel Tower, which was the famous landmark, but it's not what Grant Wood wanted to paint. It was not, it didn't, it was not super historical. I mean, it was historical. Um, it was, you know, uh, quite, it was, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50 years old um, by the time Grant Wood was there. But, um, but it was, you know, it, he wanted a different kind of Paris. Um, captured. And so he positions himself to the left so that you don't see the Eiffel Tower. And he positions himself in a way too that you don't see down the Champs-Élysées to the Arc de Triomphe. Um, so where he was standing, he could have repositioned himself a couple of different ways, but that's not what he was interested in, in the same way that he wasn't interested in painting the Roman arena. He wanted to paint that scene by the Roman arena because that was more interesting to him. Here, Saint Etienne de Mont. This is also from 1920. Um, this is a charming, charming um, church, um, and he paints it here. Uh, and you can see here with with the photograph. But what's really interesting about this is where he is standing. Again, just like the arena, he is standing kind of on this raised area. You can see a woman with a child and a couple of other women with children. People walking in the background and everything. And he's standing on actually a slightly elevated porch, a porch to the left of this building, the Pantheon, a very famous structure in Paris. Um, and you can see just to the left of the Pantheon, Saint Etienne du Mont. Um, and Grant Wood was standing um, on the left hand side of the porch, uh, probably right where this tourist's camera is. Um, there's a porch to either side um, of the entranceway there, and Grant would no doubt positioned himself there um, to paint Saint Etienne de Mont, a not super well known church, um, uh, not particularly famous church in Paris, uh, not famous like the Pantheon is. Um, but he didn't paint the Pantheon. He wasn't interested in painting the famous sites of Paris. He was interested in painting probably what he considered the authentic Paris which you see in, in, in wonderful little scenes like this, the Avenue of the Chestnuts here. Um, again, very still, very impressionistic. This is all 1920s, very much in the impressionistic mode. Um, here, a little kiosk with a little pissoir um, uh, with tobacco that sells tobacco. Um, these are just wonderful little shops. He's just capturing a slice of Paris, a slice of life in Paris. Here, wonderful light and shadow play. Old and new, again, just a, just a corner cafe, um, not a particularly grand image of Paris, um, but an authentic one, uh, one that really spoke spoke to Grant Wood. Here, just uh, outside of Paris, he and Marvin traveled to Chateauneuf a couple of times. Um, here, you can see his Impressionism um, coming through in full force um, with the woman at a fountain um, and with a bust of Voltaire. Uh, on the top of the fountain. And it's really all about the play of light and shadow. And this is a very, very authentic everyday scene in a, in a small town like Chateauneuf. Or here, the gate in the wall, which is another uh, uh, vestige of, of Roman times. This is a Roman arch. Um, I, I haven't looked for this one yet. Uh, I'll save that for another trip to Paris. Um, but uh, but here, a Roman arch that, that you know exists in uh, in Paris. Um, that uh, that he depicted. Um, and, you know, while that's, you know, perhaps more directly about the Roman arch, it's really the scene through the arch 
um, of everyday life in Paris that I think he was particularly interested in. Now he comes back to Paris in 1923-24 to study at the Academy Julien, um, and he paints uh, additional works um, that are really, again, individual slices of life in Paris. He's still very much in the impressionistic mode. Here, the runners from the Luxembourg Gardens, this is a, 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 a statue that's out in front of the Orangerie. It's not there currently, but uh, it's never been there when I've been there, but, but it was in Grant Wood's time. He's not painting the palace of the Luxembourg Gardens, the Medici Palace. No, he is instead painting uh, this bronze um, a statue of runners in front of the orangery. Uh, again, sort of a really more out of the way, um, authentic, charming aspect of a, of a grand and beautiful gardens. Also from the Luxembourg Gardens, um, the Fountain of the Medici. So um, it is still there um, and, and he's captured it very, very well. Um, but he's really trying to create an intimate space. You can see that he's not trying to capture the grandeur of the fountain at all, but he's really just trying to kind of what it would be like to be there that moment, to be to be a local. To, what what would it be like just to be passing by this every day as a part of as a part of your life? A beautiful fountain, no doubt. Grant Wood was certainly attracted to it, but he wasn't interested in in capturing the grand sweep of it. Instead, he was very much interested um, in in sort of this very uh, de uh, very focused, very uh, up close and, and zoomed in uh, image. That, that just sort of, as you might catch a glimpse of as you walk by as a Parisian. And here, new plaster in Paris, 1924, very unassuming um, uh, painting um, of, you know, how people, you know, needed to replaster their houses from time to time on the exterior. For a while, it was particularly clean and bright when the rest of the building might not be. Um, and again, very, still very much in the impressionistic um, mode, but a scene from everyday life in Paris. And it was on this trip that he, uh, his stay um, uh, at the Academy Julien that he did get away to Italy. Did he paint the grand monuments of Italy? No. He print, painted, you know, little courtyards and, and a series of arches that you see here in this Italian farmyard, little farms, the things that were authentic to his experience and his experience in Northern Italy. He returns to Paris in 1926 for a gallery at the, uh, for, gallery, for an exhibition at the Gallery Carmine, um, which he hoped would launch his career, um, but it did not. And it was a series of doorways. It was a painting of a series of doorways. He left early and painted them, painted the pictures in 1926 for the show in the summer of 1926. Um, and so you can see that these paintings of doorways, and of course, doorways are, are great symbols for passageways and for opportunity and, and so forth, um, painted this series of doors um, for this exhibition. They are all very out of the way um, uh, from uh, images of, of uh, doorways on structures outside of Paris. Um, and they're um, not the kinds of things that, that um, they speak to the grandness um, of the cities that he was visiting, um, although I'm sure many of them were significant edifices, um, he's really interested more in sort of the, um, you know, the charm of it, the everyday quality of it. And in, in this, this is a perfectly good example of the impressionistic light um, that, that comes, that, that changes, that falls across surfaces and changes um, as the day progresses, as the season changes, as weather condition changes. Um, or here again, all about the light, the light and the shadow um, that you see here. Um, this one was painted upon its return um, in a larger format, but there is a smaller version of the same painting that he did uh, on site um, in, in 1926. And he honestly did the same thing when he went in 1928 to, uh, to Munich to oversee um, the, the creation of the stained glass window that graced the Veterans Memorial Building here in Cedar Rapids. Um, made the drawings here, uh, sent them to St. Louis for fabrication. It was too big a job. Um, they sent it to their sister organization in Munich, which was quite used to doing um, large stained glass windows because when it was completed, it was the largest stained glass window in the United States at that time. Um, and he took uh, the chance to, while well, he was working with the craftsmen there, um, to go and paint a few scenes of Germany, not too many. Um, and here, an image of, of really everyday life in Munich.
um, where just, you know, uh, a mother and child just walking on the street. Again, he's very still very interested in in planes, architectural planes, um, the intersection of those planes, um, and the play of light across those planes. So he's still very much in the impressionistic mode um, in the 19 uh, later 1920s. This is all about to change um, uh, as he uh, it, as he continues in his career. And his style begins to change and, and becomes much tighter and, and the edges become firmer uh, and, and so forth. He never loses his love of light and depicting light uh, and the play of life, light across surfaces. Um, but his style, his style does change. Um, but again, you know, there's many grand things to paint um, in uh, many uh, in Munich, many sites to see. Um, but he chooses what he considered perhaps more authentic um, uh, experiences of going um, to these locations um, when he's there. So that really kind of explains this particular from the Roman Amphitheater painting uh, from 1920. It was uh, wonderful to, to figure out where Grant Wood was standing when he painted this picture. Um, it's amazing that even 100 years later, so much still remains that allows us to firmly identify the location um, where he was standing when he painted this. Um, and it, it reinforces um, something that I had discovered on previous trips that Grant Wood was not interested in the famous sites in Paris, but was really interested in capturing what everyday life in Paris was like. And this fits nicely um, in that, uh, in that uh, series. So while it purports to be from the Roman amphitheater, and it is technically, um, it's not of the Roman amphitheater. Um, instead, it is of this wonderful little park um, that um, it, it's this pocket park that really is adjacent uh, to the Roman amphitheater. And it continues to, to tell us about the ways in which Grant Wood was viewing the world um, and the kinds of things that he wanted to, um, to, to paint, to depict um, uh, when he was in, um, not just uh, in, in Paris and in Munich, um, but also when he was in, in, in Iowa. Um, he really wanted to, to capture that authentic um, uh, everyday life um, experience um, of, of living in the places where, um, where he was. So I thank you all for joining me today. Um, the next Grant Wood in Focus will occur in March. Um, and our new curator, Julia Jessen, will be taking um, that one on, subject TBD. Um, so I hope you tune in for that. Um, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. Just another look um, at, uh, at Grant Wood through, through the lens of, of a single painting. So uh, thank you so much. And I look forward um, to, um, to future uh, Grant Wood in focus um, uh, sessions with you.